So ready to start. <laughs> okay. Okay. So today we come to the second class in this introduction to the Buddha's teaching series. And this class will focus on what is often taken to be the core or essential teachings of the Buddha. And this is the particular framework that the Buddha used called the Four Noble Truths. And in the discourses of the Buddha, when we find the Buddha giving the account of his own enlightenment experience, we see that the Buddha expressed his enlightenment as the realization or penetration of the Four Noble Truths. And so when the Buddha gave his first discourse, his first formal discourse to the five ascetics, it's called the turning, setting in motion the wheel of the Dharma. He gave that discourse in terms of the Four Noble Truths. And then we see repeatedly throughout the Buddha's teaching career, he always brings the teaching again and again back to the Four Noble Truths. And so we could say that the Four Noble Truths are taken to be the, maybe the essential content or the essential framework into which the Buddha organized his teaching. And the Buddha was a very, very skillful teacher, and he knew how always to adapt the teaching precisely to the needs of the people that he was teaching. He would be able to know their, you know, their deep inner needs, their psychological tendencies, their interests. And so he would use various skillful means to awaken their interests, to appeal to their inclinations. But once he got the people disposed towards his teaching, then he'll bring the teaching back to the Four Noble Truths. And when anybody achieves realization in, as we see in the suttas, in the discourses, what they realize in turn are the Four Noble Truths. So we can say that the Four Noble Truths, it's not only a teaching device, but it's the essential content of awakening or realization. Okay, so what are these Four Noble Truths? And you'll find them described, we gave out books, sort of accompanying reading for this course. So you find it described in the book by Walpula Rahula, What the Buddha Taught, and the other book called Fundamentals of Buddhism. So the Four Noble Truths are Okay, I have to use, I'm trying to use foreign words minimally in this course, but to state the first noble truth, I have to make use of this word in the Pali language, which it's often, it's a very difficult word to translate. The word is dukkha, which you'll see here. And often it's translated as suffering, and so sometimes people get the impression that Buddhism is saying that all life is suffering or that Buddhism is pessimistic because all it does is focus on suffering. <laughs> and so it seems that Buddhism is such a dark, grim, pessimistic teaching that one might wonder how could anybody be attracted to this teaching? But then when you see people who are practicing the Buddha, Buddhism really seriously, very diligently and faithfully, you would think that they would be going around with rather dark, <laughs> grim expressions on their face. <laughs> like, if you say good morning, they will look at you and go, <laughs> But usually they have bright, smiley f faces and a very happy temperament. You know, so why is that? Okay, I think part of the problem is that the word dukkha has a wide range of meanings. So the original meaning, the common usage in the Buddha's time, was in fact 
pain and suffering. But the Buddha took that word from common usage and then he gave it a sort of wider meaning, almost elevated, elevated it to the position of like the cornerstone of a philosophical teaching. And so the basic sense of the word dukkha, the way I explain it and understand it, is that in our life, we find that things are constantly out of balance, that there's a sense of some kind of lack, deficiency, inadequacy. Things are never quite perfect, never quite fitting our expectations and desires. And so there's always this kind of gap or gulf between the way we would want things to be and the way things actually are. And that gap between them, that kind of differential between them, is what gives rise to the sense that things are out of balance, things are not quite perfect, things are not quite to our liking. And this is the sense of dukkha, the philosophical meaning of dukkha. And we could say the different aspects, actually. Oh, we're going to come to that later. Okay, so the Buddha starts off with the first noble truth is the noble truth of dukkha, that there is a sense in life that there's some kind of deficiency, inadequacy, um, some kind of problematic nature to life, which can generate feelings that range all the ways from intense suffering and misery, even despair, all the ways to just this very delicate, very subtle sense of dissatisfaction or discontent sort of that's always or often humming just beneath the surface of our, of our mind. Okay, then the second noble truth is the inquiry into what is the origin of this dukkha. What is the cause of dukkha, of this whole range of feelings that extend from intense suffering to this very subtle discontent? And the answer the Buddha gives to that is craving. I'm going to come into more detailed treatment of the Four Truths as we go along. But first, I just want to show the sort of structure or logic of the Four Noble Truths. So we have the problem of human existence, the problem of dukkha, then the quest to find the underlying root, the origin of dukkha, which the Buddha pinpoints as craving. Then in the third Noble Truth, he raises the question, is it possible to put an end to dukkha, to suffering, dissatisfaction, discontent, and so forth? And the answer he gives is that it is possible. It's possible to reach a state of perfect, unconditioned happiness and peace. And that is what we call nirvana, or in Pali, nibbana. And that is to be achieved by eliminating the cause of dukkha, that is, the elimination of craving, by reducing, overcoming, and eventually eradicating craving. The Buddha says that is possible. That's, he says, that is what I have achieved. And then, if we're going to reach the cessation of suffering, we need a way to go about that. And that is 
the fourth noble truth, which is called the way to the cessation of dukkha. And here the Buddha has laid out, again, a very systematic method, which is called the Noble Eightfold Path. It's a path of practice, a path to apply to one's life that consists of eight factors, as we'll see. And it's said that the four noble truths correspond to the model of a medical formula. So sometimes the Buddha is called the great physician. Just as a physician, a doctor, treats a patient and helps the patient to overcome their illness. So the Buddha looks at humankind, examines the illness of humankind, and then following the formula of medical practice, first he pinpoints what is the disease from which humankind is suffering, Then, like a doctor, doctor seeks the cause of the disease. So the Buddha seeks the cause of suffering. And then <clears throat> the doctor has to determine whether a cure is possible and what has to be done to achieve the cure. So that is like the third noble truth. And then the doctor will prescribe some kind of course of treatment, the remedy for the disease. And that is like the fourth noble truth. And then when we look at the, the four noble truths again, from another angle, we could see that they can be divided into two cause and effect relationships. So the first two noble truths, we have, we could say, the problem of human life the problem of bondage. So here we have the diagnosis of the problem and then the exposition, the disclosure of the cause of that problem. With the third and fourth noble truth, again, we have a cause and effect relationship. We have the effect is the cure, the cessation of dukkha, the elimination of craving, and then we have the cause or means for achieving that effect, which is the Noble Eightfold Path. And so all of this hangs together, you can see, in a very carefully structured, very precise way. Okay, now I'm going to go into somewhat more detailed treatment of each of the Noble Truths individually particularly now focusing on the first and second noble truths. The other truths we'll deal with in more detail as we go along in this course. Okay, first we have the noble truth, what I call the noble truth of, here translated the noble truth of suffering, but maybe better just to use the Pali word, the noble truth of dukkha. And there are different ways of looking at this noble truth. Okay, one way in which to distinguish the different forms of dukkha I have here is between physical, psychological, and existential dukkha. And we could see this distinction if we look at the Buddha's first discourse, which I'll call up.
I want to go down a few points in the zoom so I get the whole thing. Is this visible in the back? In the back? Okay. Okay, so here the Buddha is expounding on the first noble truth. So he says, this is the noble truth of suffering. And so he says, I'll, I'll use the English word suffering. Birth is suffering, aging or old age is suffering, illness is suffering, death is suffering. So we could say that these are in the first instance, at one level, we could say that these are manifestations of physical suffering. So the moment of birth, getting expelled from the womb, coming out into the world. I don't have a recollection of it, but I assume that it is painful. Um, aging <laughs> is certainly bound up with suffering. Um, yeah, coming to experience that more and more. Then illness is suffering, and the experience of death is suffering. But of course, also these can become causes at another level of psychological suffering. Since when one gets old and one thinks, I don't want to be old, I wish I were young again. When one falls ill, one wishes, I, was, I wish that I was healthy and strong and vigorous. And of course, we're all facing death, and there's a natural instinct to recoil from death and to wish we can go on living forever and ever, maintaining a youthful body and the full vigor of our strength and health. But inevitably, we face old age, illness, and death. Okay, but. At the first level, we could say that these are types of physical or bodily suffering. Then comes three types, or three items that the Buddha enumerates that we can take to be psychological suffering. So union with what is displeasing is suffering. Not only with external things like seeing disagreeable sights, tasting disagreeable food, hearing a lot of noise, and so on. But coming together with disagreeable people is also a kind of suffering. And then separation from what is pleasing is suffering. Separation from the things that we enjoy and take delight in and then separation from the people that we love, that we have strong affection for. And in the course of life, this separation, it's inevitable. All of our relations with all of our loved ones, at some point, have to come to an end. Even if they're the closest family members, either they will pass away while we continue to live, or we will pass away while they go on living. But that separation is inevitable. So that is a kind of dukkha. Okay, then not to get what one wants is dukkha. So here we can see maybe the way craving is operating most directly as a cause of dukkha. I want to have a new car, I can't get one. I want things always to go my way, they don't go my way. I want this, I want that, I want to be rich, I want to be famous, I want to be respected. I don't get that, I'm upset. I get angry, I get resentful. Different forms of dukkha. So these types are perhaps the most evident in our experience, in our day-to-day -day experience. So these, you could say, are constant forms of dukkha that we're experiencing countless times every day. But the last one, this is the subtlest, deepest, and most difficult aspect of dukkha to understand. Here the Buddha says, in brief, 
the five aggregates subject to clinging are dukkha, the suffering. <clears throat> okay, this, here the Buddha is using a technical term that becomes very, very prominent, very important term in his, in his teaching. So the Buddha speaks about a living being, a sentient being, our self. When we speak about ourselves, what actually does the word myself refer to? So usually we think I have some kind of self, some kind of ego entity behind my experience. Somebody that always remains the same, that always remains const <coughs> constant. <coughs> But the Buddha speaks about a sentient being or a person as being constituted by five types of factors, five physical and mental factors. Oh, I don't have that pocket. Yeah, so when we refer to myself or I, taking ourselves to have some kind of real substantial self there, the Buddha says that those terms are actually designating these five factors that constitute the living being, that constitute the person. And so, what I am really is this functioning together of these five constituents, which we call, these are what we call the five aggregates. And they're the five aggregates subject to clinging, because these are the things that I cling to as the basis for my sense of personal identity. This is sort of the foundation on which I build my sense of personal identity. But what the Buddha says that these five factors are all impermanent in that they are always arising and passing away. That they all depend upon conditions and so there's nothing solid, substantial, and absolute in them. But they arise through the functioning of conditions. And so what we have is the bodily form, what you can see of another person, and what you feel when you get a sense of your physical presence. Then there are feelings, the word feeling here is not referring to emotions as such, but to feelings of pleasant, painful, neutral feelings. Then there are perceptions, acts by which we perceive things in our environment or things going on within ourselves. 
the acts by which we can identify and recognize and label and distinguish all of the aspects that we, everything that we experience, then in response to our perceptions, there will arise some kind of volitional activity, liking or disliking, striving to achieve some aim, formulating purposes and seeking to achieve our purposes. And then there's the, say, the fundamental awareness of all of this, which is consciousness. And all of these factors, the Buddha says, are undergoing a rising they're undergoing change at every moment. They're constantly arising and passing away. And so we seem to have some kind of constant, enduring, substantial self. But in fact, when we look at ourselves using the tool of insight, looking deeply into our body and mind, we find just this bundle of factors, all of them arising and passing, all of them undergoing constant change. And so because they're constantly undergoing change, never standing still for a moment, all dependent on conditions, they're not a basis for true security, for true lasting happiness. Even though we cling to them in the hope that they will give us real happiness. So that is why the Buddha says that these five aggregates are dukkha. So I call this, in my outline, I call this the aspect of existential dukkha. So it's an aspect of dukkha that spreads to all of our experience. And so we have the three levels here, we could see in the first noble truth, from birth to death, we could say these are the manifestations of physical suffering. The middle three, union with what is displeasing, separation from what is pleasing, not to get what one wants, those are three aspects of psychological suffering or dukkha. And then the five aggregates subject to clinging, that is existential dukkha. Okay, another way in which the texts analyze and explain the first noble truth, they speak about another three levels of dukkha. Okay, one is what we could call ordinary suffering. So this would be bodily pain, pain that comes from illness, the ordinary aches and pains of the body, So this is obvious, clear, ordinary suffering, bodily and, bodily and mental suffering. The second level is called the dukkha due to change. And this kind of dukkha applies to pleasant and enjoyable situations. Okay, so say I meet some friends that I haven't seen for a long time, and we get together, we go out together, we're enjoying ourselves, laughing, dining, um, joking together. So I'm in a happy situation, very pleasant situation, but then my friend has to go away, and then I feel sad. Okay, but if we look at the situation sort of with a deep penetration, we could say that even when 
I'm out there enjoying myself. Because there's a kind of grasping of that situation, sort of a subtle clinging in the mind to that situation, hoping it will last forever, even in the midst of enjoyment, that enjoyment has a certain subtle kind of dukkha or unsatisfactoriness underlying it. Um, maybe you go out for a delicious meal <laughs> and you get served very splendid food and then you're eating it, but if you reflect on it, that meal is going to come to an end. <laughs> and then <laughs> when the meal comes to an end, then you realize that even when you were enjoying that meal, it was not really such a big deal after all. <laughs> it was not giving a kind of lasting, stable kind of satisfaction. But there was even a kind of subtle, you say, even a subtle kind of anxiety bound up with enjoying that meal. The sense that, in fact, what I found, <laughs> I don't know if other people share this experience, when you go for a delicious meal, okay, you get various items on your plate, and so when you're eating one thing that might be very delicious, but you're really thinking about the other items on the plate, right? <laughs> and then while you're eating the main course, you're thinking about the dessert. <laughs> and while you're eating the dessert, you're thinking about the cup of good coffee that will come after the dessert. So if you look, even in eating that delicious meal, that in that enjoyment of the food, each stage of the meal, there's some kind of something underlying that that's not quite satisfying. <laughs> and then when you finish the meal completely, if you're in the restaurant, then you have to pay the bill. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is the dukkha due to change, the fact that even the most enjoyable experiences have to come to an end. And then the third level of dukkha, this is what I call the dukkha of conditioned existence, that is the same, the dukkha that comes, that unsatisfactory nature of the five aggregates. Because everything that constitutes our existence, everything that we cling to, that we hold to as being I and mine, is just a process of factors that are arising and passing away through conditions. Okay, here I'm going to come into the con controversial area, a controversial area. Now, in the first Noble Truth, the Buddha speaks about the suffering of birth, old age, sickness, and death and then the other kinds of psychological suffering. But according, and you might think, okay, so we go through all of that one time, then it's over and done with, we die, everything finished, so nothing really to, you know, that should become a big obstacle to our enjoying our life. But what the Buddha teaches is that death does not mark the end of the life process, but rather the life process, the Buddha says, has been going on through time without beginning. That through beginningless time, we ourselves have been passing through this round of rebirths. We don't use, in Buddhism, we don't use the word reincarnation, which is somewhat misleading, because reincarnation implies that there is a soul, like some kind of entity that remains the same, and it drops the body and the soul goes on to another body, always remaining the same. But what the Buddha teaches is that life is a process, a process that's always undergoing change. And the core of the life process is the stream of consciousness. And the stream of consciousness arises in any existence, arises on the basis of a physical body. 
And so the physical body supports, you could say the physical body is the support for the stream of consciousness. It's the engine through which the stream of consciousness operates. But the body wears out in time, or it meets with some accident or illness prematurely, and the body, when it wears out or is in some way damaged beyond repair, it can no longer support the stream of consciousness. But the stream of consciousness doesn't come to an end, but it moves on to another physical manifestation, a new existence. And that is what we call rebirth. I'm going to deal with rebirth in much more detail, not the next class, I think it's the second class from today. So I don't want to get into details about rebirth here, but just to point out that according to the first noble truth, the dukkha that we experience, the suffering of birth, old age, illness, and death, doesn't occur just once and then it's finished forever, but rather each time we undergo a new existence, we encounter those same types of dukkha. We undergo birth in some form or another, we grow up, we enjoy our life, maybe, well, it seems that we're enjoying our life, till we reach the peak of maturity, then comes the gradual decline with all of its infirmities, then we die. Then following death, again, the stream of consciousness moves on to a new manifestation. And the way the Buddha sees this with his deep penetrative knowledge, this has been going on without any first point. World systems arise, um, we come into these world systems, take different forms of life, and then world systems dissolve, and then the life forms move on to new manifestations. Okay, so this gives us a kind of broad, very broad way to look at the truth of dukkha. So, in fact, in the sutta, the Buddha says that he asked the monks, what do you think is more, the tears that you, the waters in the four great oceans, or the tears that you have shed while you've been wandering through the round of rebirths? And then the monks give the right answer. They say, the way we see it, the tears that we have shed while we've wandered through the round of rebirths is greater than the water in the four great oceans. Okay, so that is the first noble truth. Maybe I'll just finish all four noble truths, then I'll ask for questions. Okay, then we come to the second noble truth, and here, the, this is the truth of the origin of dukkha. And here the Buddha is looking deeply at the underlying root of all of these forms of dukkha, of suffering. And his approach is not just to treat the symptoms, not just to offer patchwork treatment of the different outer manifestations, of suffering, but to look deeply to find the cause. And so the Buddha finds the cause of dukkha not in accidents, not in external circumstances, the environment, and so forth, but in the mind, it's in the human mind. So the cause, the Buddha says, is craving. And the word craving, sometimes some people translate the Pali word, tanha, is desire. And then they say, Buddha, Buddhism teaches that desire is the cause of suffering, and therefore we have to get rid of desire. But desire can be a good thing. And so that is somewhat misleading to translate the second noble truth as desire. Because according to, the Buddha, to Buddhism, there are good desires and bad desires. So the word the actual Pali word that's translated as craving.
You know, the Pali word is tanha, but the Sanskrit word, the same word, slightly different spelling, is trishna. And I think in the Sanskrit form, you could see the English word thirst. Because the English word thirst and the Sanskrit trishna actually have a common origin. So what is meant when we, by this word we translate as craving is like a thirst. It's a thirst to swallow up things and absorb them into oneself as the basis for one's own identity. And the Buddha specifies when he analyzes the nature of craving, he spells out three types of craving. <clears throat> One is the craving for sensual pleasures, pleasures through the eye, ear, nose, tongue, and body, beautiful forms, delightful sounds, of fragrant odors, delicious tastes, pleasant bodily sensations, entertaining and stimulating mental ideas to stimulate the mind. So that is the craving for sensual pleasures. But then there's a second type of craving, which is the craving for continued existence. So this is the craving that first it manifests in a clinging to the five aggregates, the factors of body and mind, taking them to be mine, what I am myself. And then when this body can no longer serve as a basis for the continuing stream of experience, then this craving for existence drives the stream of consciousness into a new manifestation, into a new rebirth, a new incarnation. And so that is how, and then once that new existence occurs, it begins with conception leading to birth, then to culminating in old age, illness, and death. And so in this way, its craving is seen as that dynamic force that drives the cycle of rebirth, that drives the repetition of the process of birth, old age, and death. And then the third type of craving it's a rather difficult one to understand, and I have to confess I've never really fully understood it myself. It's called, in Pali, vibhavatanha, which means the craving for annihilation, the craving for non-existence. And it might seem, you might think intuitively, that this would be like the kind of craving that drives somebody to commit suicide. But in the text, it's never explained in that way. But I think the way it's understood is that for somebody has a kind of repulsion to existence and doesn't want to, they, want, they don't want to go on continuing in the cycle of rebirth. And so they come to the idea, they grasp hold of the idea that at death, everything comes to an end. When the body dies, Everything is finished. Just one is alive, death takes place. And <laughs> when death takes place, it's like turning off the machine. No more picture. <laughs> Shutting down the computer. Nothing continuing. Okay, then I have in the outline how craving functions as a cause of dukkha. Okay, I distinguish this in two ways. One I call psychological, the other I've coined the expression metapsychological, beyond the psychological. Okay, so taking first the psychological aspect, how craving is a cause of dukkha, dissatisfaction. Okay, we can see this at certain stages. 
Okay, first, craving arises for something that I don't have. I see somebody has a nice iPhone, I don't have the, the la what's the latest iPhone? 5.0? What? <laughs> They're up to 10. Somebody's making a lot of money. <laughs> okay, so, I mean, I was using iPhone 2 <laughs> about two years ago. <laughs> okay, so I see, okay, in the store, iPhone 10 has just come out. I remember when, I think it was the iPhone 5 came out, there was a news report showing people were lining up like the night before outside the Apple store in New York City. The line was winding around the block. People are waiting to get their, you know, the, as soon as it comes out, it was to come out, you know, the store was to open at what, at 8 a.m., 9 a.m., people are waiting the night before, standing up all night to get the iPhone. Okay, so I get my iPhone 10, so I'm craving, I'm dissatisfied, I'm dissatisfied with my iPhone 5, the 10 is available. So, that dissatisfaction and the craving to get the iPhone 10. Okay, then, to get the iPhone 10, I ha need some money, so I have to struggle, work hard to accumulate the money to buy it. Okay, I go to the store, buy the iPhone 10, now I have it, there's the delight of possession. But then comes another kind of dukkha, which is that of, we call it maybe, anxious concern. So I'm always afraid that I'm going to, somebody might steal my iPhone, I always have to look after it, to protect it, to be sure it's functioning properly. So there's a kind of anxiety bound up with, with possession. Then maybe the iPhone 10 now is getting old and not functioning properly, so then comes disappointment with the object of the enjoyment. And then either the phone breaks down and then, or somebody say, I misplace it somewhere, and it's lost. So there comes the suffering of loss. Or the iPhone 12 comes out, and then I look at my iPhone 10, and I see my friends are going around with their iPhone 12, chatting about it, and they're asking, how is your iPhone? What do you have? I have an iPhone 10, <laughs> and so I'm out of date. So these are some of the ways in which dukkha arises from craving, that it's bound up with this craving. That is the psychological aspect. Then what I call the metapsychological aspect is the way craving sort of attaches to these five aggregates and holds on to them. And then when these five aggregates break down at death, then craving is what drives the stream of consciousness into a new existence and starts again the round of birth and death. So that is the sort of the beyond the psychological aspect. So that is the very deep existential relationship between craving and dukkha. Okay, then the third noble truth is the cessation of dukkha, which comes through the elimination of craving. And again, this has two stages corresponding to the two functions of craving. We can say there's the psychological aspect. So when craving is eliminated, then there comes right here and now freedom from this dukkha. There's no more grasping, no more clinging, no more insatiable desire for what I don't have, 
but there comes a kind of peace and serenity, fulfillment, a kind of inner freedom from the compulsive drives of craving. So that is the psychological aspect. Then the metapsychological is that when craving is eliminated, then the round of birth and death comes to an end, and there comes the liberation into that ultimate state of freedom, which is nirvana. I don't want to go into details of that now, because we'll come to that more later in this course. Okay, then the fourth noble truth is the way to freedom from dukkha. And that is the Noble Eightfold Path, which is right view, if we look at the Buddha's first discourse. Oh, here it was abridged. Okay, it's right view. You don't have to take notes on this because it's in the book, The Noble Eightfold Path. Right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. Again, we'll have actually two classes on the Noble Eightfold Path. And then what's very important but often overlooked is that the Buddha speaks about four tasks, each four tasks to be performed in regard to the Four Noble Truths. And so each Noble Truth has its own specific task. The, noble, the first Noble Truth, the truth of Dukkha, has to be thoroughly understood. The origin, that is craving, has to be eliminated, to be abandoned. The truth of the cessation of suffering is to be experienced, to be realized, to be attained. And then the path, the Noble Eightfold Path, is to be practiced. Okay, so I think that sort of covers, gives a broad overview of the Four Noble Truths. We have some time, so maybe for about 10 minutes or so, we could take some questions. So please feel welcome to ask, and don't feel shy about asking questions. I always think when people don't ask questions, either that the talk has been boring or incomprehensible. <laughs> oh, okay, good. Hi, Vante. Yeah. Um, I have a question about um, basically the definition of consciousness. Is, yeah. it, is it equal to, is the same as craving? And then that is basically the stream of consciousness you're talking about when we are reborn? When um, we are, when there's a when we're uh, when we go into rebirth, yeah. that the stream of consciousness is basically the same as craving, and that's what's that's the driving force. No, no, the stream of consciousness is not the same as craving. We could say that craving is inherent in the unenlightened consciousness. So, consciousness is. I'm going to go into the five aggregates more detail, I think, next week's... No, not, I think in two weeks, into more detail. Um, but consciousness, I would say, is the awareness that arises through the six sense faculties, through the eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, or the inner mental consciousness, or, or, or through the inner mind. So that is consciousness, the awareness of objects through the sense faculties. Um, and craving, of course, arises in association with consciousness. It's sort of linked up with consciousness, but it's not the same as consciousness. Because craving can be eliminated, but we still continue to be conscious. So then what, it, so now the stream of consciousness that after our body dies, that continues on, yeah. is that like does that look like, um, is that like a, our memories, or okay, this, what force is that? Okay, like, what the does that stream look like? of consciousness, you say, is driven or pushed into a new existence through the craving for new existence. 
So if we don't crave, we don't, we won't exist yeah, again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And but when you're talking about the stream of consciousness that go, what is that exactly? That's the consciousness. What is that? Yeah. That's it's so hard for me to get a grip on that. Like uh, it, you say, a stream of consciousness yeah. that because okay. of craving will continue yeah. for a new yeah. rebirth. But what do you mean by consciousness? Yeah. If it's not craving, then okay, it's what's the capacity that for, for being aware of of objects, the, the capacity for awareness. Okay. Okay, so that is what continues. And it does preserve, we call it memory impressions and dispositions from our present life and from even from earlier lives. So this is why people have different inclinations, tendencies, dispositions, even they say like, I think that there have been studies done of just newly born children that their characters can be so different. Mm. Some are happy and smiley, others are gloomy, some are inquisitive, others are sort of self-contained. So we, we would, from a Buddhist standpoint, we would say that this is the reflection of their tendencies from their previous lives coming into manifestation. So without, um, so with, so as long as there's no craving, that awareness can be and it wait, as long be, as there is. As long as there. Wait, what did I just say? <laughs> as long as if there's awareness, yeah. as long as there's no craving, once our body drops, there could be. There's just nothing left, I guess, or there's no awareness to then have. There's no craving that goes along with the awareness to cling to it. Yeah, body. I don't want to get into that <laughs> I'm subject myself right now. Really yeah. confused and deep. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Bobby. I had a question on um, um, maybe it's uh, sort of how, think, how, how terms are translated, but yeah. um, when, when, when it's saying, for example, that birth is suffering or the five aggregates are suffering, yeah. should we read that as these things inevitably contain and give rise to suffering? Or is there some deeper sense in which you know, they, there's no distinction between them and suffering, you see what I'm saying? It's, yeah, I think, yeah, this is where I think the word suffering can be somewhat misleading. I'd say that. I just like to keep the Pali word, say birth is dukkha, that there's something unsatisfactory there. Well, certainly like old age, sickness, and death, there is suffering connected with them. But we would say that because there's suffering connected with them, that they're dukkha, but not that dukkha is, identically, is identical with suffering. And in that deeper sense that you spoke about, that is what pertains to the statement that the five aggregates are dukkha. Not that their five aggregates are suffering, because we have enjoyment and pleasure through all of the, you know, through all of the different senses, but even inherent within that enjoyment, there's some element that's not completely perfect, not in perfect balance. Hi. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I'm... <laughs> Fa very fascinating. Thank you yep. very much. Um, just one of the things that popped up in my mind is, um, you know, is it more difficult to uh, practice uh, or try to penetrate these truths in a world where we're bombarded? In a world where what? Where we're bombarded with iPhone 12 ads and mm -hmm. internet yeah, and social yeah. media. Yeah. Yeah. Is it really more difficult today to try and do this? And <laughs> I'd say that certainly that these things, the constant barrage of ad advertisements, um, as well as the sense that builds up sense of prestige on material possessions and so forth, all of that I'd say does create obstacles to practice. But we shouldn't be deterred by the obstacles. We still have to continue the practice in their midst. But life, what I've seen in my own experience in Sri Lanka is that simple village people who are not exposed to all of these materialistic cravings, when they take up the practice of meditation, <laughs> they advance, or at least some of them can advance very quickly, whereas we sophisticated Westerners, 
advance at a rather sluggish pace, probably because th their minds are quite much simpler than our own. Kind of connected to that question, um, do you have some, or what, what would maybe be uh, Buddha's recommendation or teaching if you start experiencing um, dukkha in relation to your practice? Like, you're frustrated because, like, I'm not meditating the way I want to be, or um, uh, what would be another uh, dukkha in relation to your practice? I'll just say meditation. Let's say that you experience some frustration with your meditation practice. Yeah, uh, okay, I mean, this opens up like the big subject. But what I would say is that, first of all, that when one takes up the practice, one has to be patient in one's practice and recognize that like, this is a long journey and as the practice proceeds, various things, up, inner obstacles, are going to start manifesting. And one of the pieces of advice that my first Buddhist teacher gave me is that the obstacles are, in a sense, the path. If there were no obstacles, there would be no progress. So when you meet obstacles in your, in your practice, <laughs> then you realize that this is sort of the nutri nutriment out of which the practice is going to develop. It's like, what is it they use? Manure that they use to, as fertilizer for crops. So without that manure, you know, the crops wouldn't grow. So the various problems, obstacles, drawbacks that we meet in our practice, that's the material that will help us to develop. Okay, maybe we could take one more question, then we'll have to go into the little break than the practice session. <clears throat> Excuse me, my name is Beth. Uh, from the reading, um, what struck me most was the talk of soul. Uh, I grew up, maybe many of you, many of you yeah. as well, is I think, therefore I am. And, yeah. and so, uh, looking at these thoughts, um, that is not the case. Yeah. Uh, maybe you have something you can explain. Um, is, is, this, um, is this craving or, or, or yeah, I don't I'm have going, all the terminology. I'm, yeah, I'm going to speak about that more. I think it's not next week. I think it's the, the week after that. Yeah, so let's hold with, with that issue. And then I think, did you have a question? Okay, since you're, I bypassed your question, so let's Thank you. It. And your name, so I just get... Oh, I'm Shelley. Shelley. You had just said the obstacles are the path, and that led to the question I was forming. As we have cravings, yeah. and we get more evolved, and yeah. hopefully more spiritual, <laughs> do the cravings then lead to different cravings, or do we sort of have fewer cravings? <laughs> I think it's different for different people. But let's say, if the practice is going successfully, the grosser types of craving should subside. But still, there'll be like many subtle levels of craving. And often what happens when people get involved in, in intensive practice, then they start having craving for higher realizations, high, deeper attainments. And then if they don't achieve what they aspire to as quickly as they want, then they feel disappointment and sometimes discouragement. Okay, I think we'll have to move into maybe, let's see what time it is now. About five after three. So we just take a short break, then we'll go into the practice session. So 3.15, we'll be back in the other section of the room. <laughs>